you. Thanks. Well, those are um, very kind words. Thank you. It's a lot of a, a lot of things to pack into some time. I want to thank the chamber for giving me an opportunity to talk about uh, the work uh, that have been uh, accomplished across our organization. I am uh, those things she described. I'm I'm a pediatrician, but I'm a husband and a dad, uh, a friend to many people, and I want to thank all of you for being willing to share your lunch with what's going to be a fair amount of a fair amount of information. I. Um, I'm also not very fancy, so I'm going to take my coat off because I plan to move kind of quickly here. So I might take off the microphone as well, and then I'll be in big trouble with my friends. So here's what I want to do. What I want to do is, is convince you, um, convince you that our accomplishments, the things I'm going to talk about, are our national recognition, our activities in the community are not about the recognition, but they're about a thoughtful approach to being a corporate citizen in healthcare. I, I, I want to I want to talk to you about the cost of healthcare. I want to talk about the challenges, and I want to talk to you a bit about um, how we need partners to help us accomplish what we need to accomplish. So, so that's what the uh, that's what the next uh, half hour is going to uh, look like unless I, unless I run over to 2 or 3 o'clock and then it'll look a lot longer. So, so here's, here's today's medicine for you. We're, we're going to talk about what I believe corporate citizenship is and costs. I want to talk about how this affects you, how it affects you as a business, how it affects us as a community, and how, and how taking care of a community is more than just sick people in, in the box, in the hospital, in the clinic. It's about taking care of the health, the well-being, the finances, the whole social milieu of our community. That's what we're gonna, that's what we're gonna talk about. So, so where'd we come from? Uh, many of you know this story. Sig uh, was on this podium a number of years ago that, and explained that. Um, started with a clinic, a hospital, um, expansion of the clinic, eventually merger of the clinic and the hospital, and now uh, broad partnerships outside of those two uh, folks. Medical education, medical education and uh, research have been an important uh, part of what we have done, and, and of course, in the last number of years, broadening out our connection with the community. Now, we are spread across the upper Midwest. This is where you think of us. You think of um, a system of clinics and hospitals, ambulances, electronic records. That's all very true. Lots of clinics, now five hospitals. A foundation, the foundation's integral to our success. Heads up the education training the future, has research. The Children's Miracle Network is part of uh, the foundation, another unique part of our organization the rest of the country uses to take care of only its own. Our Children's Miracle Network takes care of the whole region. We have thousands of employees, over 500 doctors, and almost 300 PAs and nurse practitioners. A large group, highly trained individuals focused on the same goals. Here's some other people that are focused on our goals. Here's our board of trustees. People of the community, some from inside, clinicians from inside, members, leadership uh, from the community that most of you will recognize, thoughtful folks. Who governs Gunderson? These people. Who owns Gunderson? The community. It helps align the focus and where we're at. Who leads the staff? It's this mix of medical and administrative folks, folks with medical, nursing backgrounds, business, finance, engineering. These are our senior leaders who then work with our team leads made up of medical and administrative partners. So we have a doc, a doc and a business trained person on every team for every clinical part of our organization. It's a way, it's a way to add the strengths and say, how do we take care of the patients but understand that we have to do it in a way that takes care of the staff and takes care of our community. 
So we take all that work, all those people, all those plans, we put it on one piece of paper. This is our strategic plan. We show this all over the country. People say, wow, you're sharing your strategy. Oh my goodness. Well, if everybody adopted this strategy, I'm going to convince you, it'd be a great thing for healthcare. Because the strategy right at the top says, our purpose, our purpose is to bring health and well being to patients and the communities we serve. Pushes us out, starts pushing out right away. We're going to do it so well, we're going to be nationally recognized. Not for the national recognition. Not for the national recognition. We're doing it so well that it does get recognized. We're not aiming for mediocrity. We're aiming to do as absolutely well as we possibly can. There's a number of unique pieces in this as, that you might not see in other places. In our great place to work, our admonition to our employees, it's a culture of caring, pretty similar in most healthcare, but of improvement, improvement. We have every day, we need to be better for our patients, for their families, for our business partners, and for the community. We believe, we believe, now you're gonna see this in less than 10% of healthcare organizations in the country. It doesn't say make a lot of money, it doesn't say have an operating margin, it doesn't say build buildings. It says, it says make it affordable. Not make, not, not make money. It says make it affordable for the community, for the employers, for the patients. We are fully aware that healthcare costs a lot. And our job is to make it more affordable and to grow, not to take over the world, not to say we're the biggest. It's not about size, it's what you deliver. It's what you deliver to the patients and their families. That's where we need to go. So how are you gonna get there? How are you gonna take this complex business taking care of patients and get better? Well, you, um, you go out to the staff. You go out to the clinics. Here's uh, Mary Lou and Deb, a couple of our vice presidents, in a clinic, looking at a performance board, looking at a board that describes, well, let me see all those things I said. Quality, service, um, affordability. How are, we, how are we gonna get it? We take it, we measure it, and we work very, we work very hard to improve. We have a system. Did we make up the system? Well, we put the system together. The system is the best of General Electric in engaging staff, the best of lean in seeing what's out there right at the patient, right at the bedside, right in the community, and, and, and using tools to fix that. It's a constant focus, not in the old way of what's the matter with the patient, but a focus on what matters, what matters to the patient. That's a different focus of healthcare. And you're gonna see that come up uh, uh, time and again. And then we work with the largest health quality improvement organization in the world, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. And in that organization, it teaches us, as many with a science background know, you, you take data, you make a plan, you try and fix it, and then you study it again, and you do it over and over until it gets better and better and better. And that's that's how we move forward. And in fact, in our organization, every Friday at eight o'clock in the morning, every Friday at eight o'clock in the morning, people gather, two, 200 people gather and celebrate the best improvements from various parts of the organization. Might be finance, might be cardiac surgery, might be billing. We celebrate where we've improved and try and teach the rest of the organization. This has resulted, this whole approach to measuring and improving has resulted in tremendous outcomes. Why were we the first breast center in the country designated a center of excellence by the breast centers? Not by billboards, not by advertisements, by breast centers, it's because we had the best outcomes, better than Stanford, better than Hopkins. Why, why does our cardiac program by uh, Consumer Report um, put out as one of the best. Why do we have a patient in the hospital now from Alaska that came here because they believe that. Our orthopedic program, uh, tons of awards. Our primary care folks, well above the, the top 10 percentile in the country. We measure, we improve. We don't believe, just because we're terribly successful, that that's a way to do it. 
And I'm gonna, this, is a, this is a little bit of a lesson for you. There's all kinds of people that measure health care. All kinds of things out there. Um, one of the most famous, U.S. News and World Report. Half of their measure is on volume and popularity. Now, I've talked to a lot of patients. They worry about whether they're going to live or die and whether they're going to have a major complication. So one of the key pieces we use is health grades. This is a great chart. I love this chart because it's so complicated. I can say anything, and you, don't, you can't argue with me. Um, <laughs> What health grades does, it takes all the data from the federal government, not our data, federal government data on our outcomes. They look at all these different things from OB to bariatric surgery to, to heart surgery, all those things, and then they compare everybody in the same fashion. Here's Gunderson. Here's several Mayo institutions, Eau Claire, the UW, Iowa's, Iowa, University of Iowa. We compare against everyone else in the region. And when you add up how we do, there's no one in the upper Midwest that has a better profile than we do. Are we perfect? We are not perfect. We tell ourselves that every single day. Are the, or the parts of our organization that get five stars, does that mean they coast? No, they come in on a regular basis. They have to demonstrate where they're improving things consistently. So this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. When you add all this up, this is one of the reasons why our health plan, our health plan gets the highest ratings in the country every year in a row. Five, six places in the country have been able to do what they've done out of the hundreds of health plans. They run well, great people, and have terrific clinical outcomes. So one of our responsibilities is clinical outcomes, but another responsibility is to take care of the financial health of the community. In our organization, that's a common, commonly spoken phrase. In the rest of the country, that's pretty unusual. Here's an act of financial discipline. This is fiscal discipline. For 13 years in a row, our, our annual budgets, we don't really do budgeting much anymore, but 13 years in a row, our fee increase is less than the year before. 13 years in a row, there, I don't know anybody else that can say that. 13 years in a row, our fee increase is less than the year before. This is financial discipline. This is trying to take care of the community. In tough years, 2008 and 9 and 10, did we raise our prices? We did not. They, ra they rose a little, but the rate of rise has been steadily down, despite one of the biggest things. Now, I know this looks complex, but it's, I'm, I, I, in a second, you got it. This is the number of people with commercial insurance in 2000. This is the number with, with um, government pay. Over the last 12, 15 years, that's completely separated to the different divisions. More government pay, less commercial pay. Why is that important? That's important because the difference in pay. There's nobody in the upper Midwest that breaks even on Medicare and Medicaid, nobody. Nobody, nobody breaks even. 30% of our cost is what we get for Medicaid patients, 60% of our cost for Medicare patients. Commercial pays extra. The gap here is $100 million. So despite, despite having at least $100 million less in payment, remember this slide? Remember this slide. We did not take it out on the backs of the community, we took it out on improved efficiency, all those efficiencies that I was saying, all that focus on improving the health and well-being of the community, including the fiscal health of the community. We've kept those fee increases coming down despite complexity in health care. I'm not going to explain this one either. <laughs> this is how we get regulated. The people from the banks understand regulation. There's a lot of regulation. Federal, reg federal regulators over on the orange here, the state up in the green, non-governmental regulators in the blue. The good news is they all talk to each other every day and coordinate what they're doing. No, they don't. They don't talk to anybody. They don't even talk to themselves. <clears throat> Federal agencies mix up all the time. And how about this? For the lawyers in the room, there's a few lawyers in the room. You don't have to raise your hands. I won't embarrass you. Um, but the, the guys from the state, the guys in the state will say, here's how you have to 
uh, bill this, and if you don't do it this way, it's fraud. And the guys from the feds will say, if you bill it that way, it's fraud, you have to do it this way. We'll say, really? Are you going to talk to each other? No, the state guy says, no, state's rights. And the federal government says, no, we're in charge. Really, thanks. But what do we do? So it's very complex. Lots of people, smart people, wonderful people that we have to try and keep us in compliance with all these rules. But does it add complexity? It adds a tons of complexity to our organization. Do we pay taxes? Yes. In the last decade, $10 million, $40 million in taxes. No fee, uh, our fee increased less than the year before. We pay taxes more than anyone else. No one else is even close in the county. Big property tax payers. So you say, well, where, all these, where does all this money come from? Where do the patients come from? This is, this is very important. See those taxpayers down there? See train company? They make things. They make things, and the, when they sell them, that money comes back into our community. Quick Trip bakes things, and that comes back into our community. That's a good deal. Um, LHI delivers services all over the country. The money comes back into here. The community doesn't survive unless we can provide income. We just send stuff out, community doesn't survive. Here's where our patients come from. You take out La Crosse County, uh, essentially in the middle there, five or six hundred million dollars, five or six hundred million dollars from outside our immediate area come into our area for care here. This is revenue. This is not charges, revenue, revenue to. And it's not even just the immediate area in the states you see. They come from all over the country. People from all over the country come to our organization. It's outside funds come to help build, help keep our community well. So I know what you're thinking, right, he's talking, he's all proud about this money coming in, but I'm worried about the high cost of health care. Actually, I hadn't heard that before. No, I hear it all the time. Um, I am worried about it. I, I worry about it all the time. We spend a lot of time trying to say, how are we going to make it more affordable? The high cost of health care is a big problem. And then we get beat up because there's low health in the country. But I have the solution for that. People say the cost is high, but our health is low. And here's the answer. It's a Hummer. <laughs> That's not obvious? Oh, okay, I'll explain it. The, the way we do healthcare is like a big, muscly, fuel inefficient Hummer. If you need to get somebody from A to B, storm, rain, floods, or something, you're going to get there. No matter who shows up, you can put them in there, you can get them there. That's the US health system. We can, we're built to take care of everything, but we're expensive. The rest of the world, they have school buses. They take the whole population for their immunizations, for their prenatal care, for their screenings. They get the whole population there. Uh, is it as convenient? Can they do amazing miracle things like we do? Not as well. But it's less expensive. How do we spend our money? Well, I'm going to show you. But here's what determines your health. The health of the community is determined mostly by the physical environment, behaviors, smoking, obesity, those kind of things, poverty, whether the prenatal moms can actually get to a clinic, and healthcare, healthcare providers. That's what determines the health of the population. Here's how we spend our money. 80% of our money in that upper little blue wedge. 20% in the whole rest, the whole rest. So, there's a prioritization here. There's a prioritization issue here. We, we, we want to have the convenience. We want to have everything for everybody at every minute. And we ignore, we ignore getting people on a big school bus and getting them where we need. Now, who pays for all this? Where's all this money come from? Well, feel your wallet. Because it comes from you. You have higher commercial insurance. Higher commercial insurance. Remember that big slide that I said where the commercial and the Medicaid, Medicare was splitting, government pay, yeah, and that there's a shortfall with the government pay, you make up the difference. You make up the, do you, your co-pays and deductibles are higher because of that, and your taxes, personal and corporate, go in to pay Medicaid and Medicare. You're paying for it. You're paying for the care of the whole community. Most of you don't think of it like that, but that's how it works out. So you might as well help us keep the whole population healthy. Not just your employees, the whole population. Because that's what matters. Now you're saying, Jeff, that's great. 
It's great, we understand all that, so if we're paying for it, how come you built that new hospital? Well, <laughs> I know none of you really, nah, you were thinking that. I could read your mind. Um, well, we built the new hospital for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons was it was gonna be amazing for patients and better for staff. It was gonna do a lot of great things. But our, our goal for the new hospital was to not take over the world, not more, more beds, but more rooms. We wanted to become more efficient and safer and, and nice and warm, but not uh, over the top. So what are our results? Well, first of all, the cost of the new hospital is less than 1% of the organization's budget over the next 25 years. Less than 1%. We are people that take care of people. That's, that's where we're at. So we, we can, we can um, improve care. It's safer. We can make it more efficient. We can give a better experience. These are all great things. The new hospital helps us recruit and retain great staff. Remember that five, six hundred million dollars coming into the area? Yeah, it needs to come somewhere. We need to draw it in. There's a lot of competition uh, out there and uh, our energy savings are pretty significant. What about behavioral health? Well, behavioral health is a little different story. The national trend is for people to abandon and get rid of behavioral health. Hundreds and hundreds of beds. There's also half as many beds in the state of Wisconsin as there were 20 years ago. Up until we built this, there are people being shipped on a regular basis in a mental health crisis from families to all parts of the state, into Minnesota, into Iowa. We said that's not acceptable. We won't tolerate that. So we did this. And for you that run businesses, mental health issues affect 25% of your staff. And if you look at the money, even though the treatment isn't the highest cost, and when you look at the whole burden of mental health on our society, it's the highest cost to any employer and families and communities. It's a big deal. We won't abandon uh, behavioral health. Same way with our neighborhood. We said our responsibility will, will take on the neighborhood. Our, in 97, uh, parking lots look like industrial wastelands, kind of ugly. And uh, now we got the helicopter, we painted all the trees yellow, and the place is pretty. <laughs> um, no, I didn't do that. Um, that'd be wasting fuel, and I, I won't waste fuel. But we've done a lot of things. We buried a parking ramp so it wouldn't uh, stick out so much. We did the new hot, we did a lot of things to try and improve our neighborhood. And here's one, here's one, back to, this is the old, the old uh, Gorm, um, gun loft building. That's what it looked like, most of you have forgotten that. We've got $12 million of outside money, not our money, put this thing back on the tax rolls. It's now full of people, many work at Gunderson, full of people renting, a nice addition to the community. We've also added many other places in, um, around, uh, around the region, in Wakan, in Onalaska, um, that'd be Decorah, and Viroqua. Those patients that came in or coming into our region, they don't come here out of dumb luck. They come because we make a plan for it. So you gotta have a place for them, but you gotta have a system of care. And a system of care, like I was talking about, to try and deliver care as efficiently as possible to the community. Now here's something we're pretty proud about. This is Gunderson right here. Here's the cost of care for seniors in the last two years of life. That's the rest of the country above us. Remember you people that are paying tax, there's probably a few of you that pay taxes here. You're welcome. This is, this is our disciplined approach. In fact, our approach, our approach was, is so sound started as a community effort, risen up to the, the Respecting Choices uh, activity, it is so sound that in the National Commission, the National Commission uh, called the, Inst the, um, the Institute of Medicine, nonpartisan, a lot of experts, they said the best things for seniors in this country are the physician order part, a model such as Respecting Choices. They called us out, the only one in the country, and electronic health records. Um, this is the spread of our lacrosse base respecting choices. 48 states around the world. Our bereavement program even wider. Remember that thing that I talked about distinguishing ourselves in national recognition? You can't tell me we can't do it here. You can't tell me we can't do things as well as anybody anywhere. Our electronic health record is another example. Built in the clinic years ago. 
to connect up clinic spaces before hardly anybody in the country were doing it, and now you can get it on a portable device. We've pushed it out even farther, and farther than most people in the country. Well, I get a lot of questions about our environmental program. The Envision portion is our energy portion of our environmental program. We said, we said it is not all right that we're polluting the atmosphere and then taking care of the people that we make sick. So we measured how much CO2, mercury, and particulate matter we put in the atmosphere. D does anybody else know what you do to the... Yeah, I, I didn't think so. We didn't know either. We didn't know either. But we said it's not okay, but we're not just going to fix it. We're going to fix it and do it in a financially sound way. So we did that. And here's, here is some of the results there already. Massive decrease in particulate matter. It's very important for the health and well-being of the community. Was it easy? No. But we are now the only place in the country, back to distinguishing ourselves, back to doing better than anyone else, we're the only one that can say all five of our hospitals have heat, power, and cooling offset by our own renewable energy. Our own renewable energy. It's improving the health, lowering the cost. Improving the health, lowering the cost. How did we do it? We used conservation. And for the bankers, the guys that are stewing about the investment, there's my first investment. See the first investment? $2 million in conservation, and I get a million two back every single year. It's a little better than your checking account, I'd argue. That's a pretty good return. It's a pretty good return on investment. We've got $11 million of outside money. We're going to use it to lower the cost of care. And who do we support? On the money we do spend, we spend it local. The electricity is not spent on coal from Wyoming. The gas is not spent on a pipeline coming from Texas. And just one more piece. Windmills are kind of sexy and people like solar panels. That's all really cool. It's really in vogue. Here's something that's not so in vogue. Waste. Pharmaceutical waste. What do most people do? They dump it in their, in their sewer, down the drain. We at least were putting it in barrels and spending money to ship it away. But we have some folks that went after this, said that's not okay. We now have the best waste management program in the country for hospitals. We're the only place of our size that's now listed as a small waste generator because it's so small. The EPA asked us for advice from Washington and the state of Wisconsin because we were able to take 14 barrels of our pharmaceutical waste, turn it into one, and we're reducing that. The state of Wisconsin is bringing their DNR people here to train them because they really don't have anything to teach us, but they can train their people, their inspectors here. We believe we have to take care of the environment and the future. Here's the future. The future are the children. We, everybody says that. But what are we doing about it? Four children a, die, a, a day die in the United States from abuse and neglect. 1,500 a year. Millions and millions of dollars uh, go into this. Why so much? Because people that get abused often go on to abuse uh, other members of their family, causes all kinds of mental and social and, and uh, community ills. And you think it doesn't happen here? It happens here. Hundreds and hundreds in La Crosse County, thousands across Wisconsin. This is a big deal. So we've partnered, now brought underneath our wing the, uh, the National Child Protection and Training Center. 15,000 people a year from around the country are trained, educated, and and are sent out to help their communities. We've, we've done this so well. This is so well recognized. The US Army, the Olympic Committee, the Boy Scouts, the US Embassy. Who do they call? Us. They call us. We have training centers uh, around, around the country. You, you have to look at the hard problems. You have to take them on. You have to say, this is important for the well-being of the community. Here's another one, the Health Science Consortium. A number of us put it together, a number of organizations put it together a number of years ago. We've taken a part of it and focused on community health. Brenda Rooney, one of our staff, built this amazing scorecard. You go on there, you can look all about health across 23 counties on all dimensions. It is as good as any place in the country. Some, some efforts were to stimulate the mental health 
uh, coalition to get back together and get working. Some efforts to work on alcohol abuse and binge drinking got over a million dollars of outside money to help us do that and we can measure and make a difference. You want a big problem? Take on obesity. In 1990, no state had over 15% obesity rate. In 2010, no state was under 20. A tremendous epidemic. How can we possibly do anything? Well, you gotta do a lot of things. We do a lot of things. So we have a 500 club lunch sitting on your lunch. That was good. That was good, it was tasty, that's good food. We, we have portion control. This is now spread all across the Midwest and the, and the, and the Northeast. Our 500 club looking at nutritionally sound portion, portion control. We have our executive chef who used to cook for me. Now I haven't seen him in months. He's out in the schools. He's out in the schools teaching kids how to cook local vegetables, local vegetables, and grow their own food. How do you get local vegetables? Well, you have a fifth season co-op that we help get going in Viroqua that buys local food and then large organizations in the community bring, are able to buy from that. We have um, exercise, the, many of you, many of your businesses have worked with us on and of course a tremendous partnership with the, uh, with the, with the YMCA. It is, it, is, um, it, it, is, it is a whole list of things that we need to do. It is a whole list of partners that we need to work with. I can't go through all the projects we're working on, although it would be fun. Um, we have so many partners that work on so many things to improve the health and well-being. And, and some people work on specific areas, some people tie it together. Think of our media partners, print, the radio, the TV partners, who tie this together to educate us about it. We would not get where we're going without it. And here's another piece of information that you need to understand that helps make a point here. How do we get paid? How do we get paid? We get paid fee for service. The more we do, the more we get paid. The more people are sick, the more we get paid. The easier our life is in the finance side. Does that make any sense? I just told you all this stuff we're doing, trying to keep the community healthy. How does that make sense in a business sense? Well, it doesn't. And I don't know why they keep me on as a CEO, but they do. Um, it's great. So the, this makes as much sense as festival, festival having farmers markets in their parking lot. I mean, that'd be crazy. Oh, except they do that, don't they? Yeah, because they, they, they're concerned about the whole community. We have many partners that are concerned about the whole community. We have many business partners. We have work site clinics that have been successful. Work site activities, you've engaged in this. We get the work site, we get the schools thinking more healthy, we get the work sites more healthy. That's a good thing. If we take our regional partners, here's St. Joseph's Hospital in Hillsborough, we put the clinics and the hospitals together, they were losing money, their quality was low, the community didn't trust them. Brought them under the tent, brought them with us, they have done amazing work. Their day's cash on hand, they're now solvent, they're not gonna go out of business. Their quality's better. Their service scores are better. And did they do it by raising their fees? No. They dropped their fees. And in fact, this year, their fee increase is zero. Zero. Building their cash, improving their quality, fee increase is zero. That is a great movement. We've worked across the state to build the Wisconsin Collaborative, focused on public reporting of information so you can make better choices, but even better, so we can do better. We have worked with a brand new uh, strategic partnership. What's the goal? Take over the world, become the biggest? No, the goal is to increase quality, decrease cost more quickly. We didn't spend our money, we didn't give up our governance. Gunderson's still controlled by the people you see here in the room and the people on the screen. We didn't lose any assets. It's all about us. We're stretching out across the world, a volunteer program, hundreds of people, the university, many, many folks, to say we can share what we have and they can teach us from their perspective. It is this combination, this combination. We have a health science academy that, that we set up with the school district, training people for future healthcare possibilities that now goes out to Pine Ridge, one of our global partners pieces. You wanna talk about improving the fabric of the community? This improves the fabric of the community. Here's a direct quote from a high school senior after going to Pine Ridge and coming back. 
never been part of anything volunteering, and now they're going to do it the rest of their life. If you look at health care from the needs of all the disasters, all the problems, all the bad things out there, you'll get nowhere. But if you look at our assets, who's our assets? Our assets are the people in this room, are the partners that we can make across the community. That's, that's how we get forward. Not stewing about all the problems. Don't ignore them, but you focus on the faith community, and the business community, and the educational community, the media. We, we have so many, so many people who are so socially responsible in this area. So, so I'd like to make an argument that, that we, we, can, we can deliver great health care and still be a socially responsible organization. In fact, we can be so focused on the health and well-being of the community that I would argue that we classify ourselves. We've had a number of leaders in the community, uh, Dahl, Skogan, Thibodeau, talk a lot about servant leadership. So I'm going to make an argument that this is what corporate organizational servant leadership looks like, that it's taking care of the well-being of the community, regardless of how struggly it might be for your own organization. It takes care of the well-being of the community. And when we talk about the well-being of the community, it's the well-being of the whole community, the physical environment, the social environment, the mental environment, and the fiscal health of the community. I, I think I've had a good a litany of things where we distinguish ourselves. We're as good as anybody in the country. We're doing things that teach the whole world. We have an outstanding organization and an outstanding community. And there is no reason, there is no reason we need to settle for mediocrity. You have the people assets, we have the people assets. We have an abundance of talent, energy, and the social responsibility to drive this forward in your own organizations and across our community. So I want to thank you for your partnerships. The partnerships, we could not have got there without the partnerships. We could have not got there without the amazing staff at Gunderson who take care of patients and support taking care of patients in the community. So we're not done. We're not done. We have a lot to do. So I'd say let's get going. Thanks.